What's going on guys? It's your boy. Welcome back to another video. So 2023 has came to an end and it is now 2024 and uh, there are a lot of fun and exciting superhero movies that came out last year and superhero TV shows that came out last year. So uh, I wanted to go ahead and kind of rank them all together. Um, so that being said, let's go ahead and dive right into this. Alrighty, before I get too far into this, I do need to quickly mention something and address something. Um, Invincible on Amazon Prime came out last year. Um, that is not going to be on this list for two reasons. One, um, I'm pretty sure they just released like the first half of the season and then the second half of the season is coming out at some point this year. Not entirely sure. Either way, I have not seen it yet. That's the other reason why it's not going to be on this list. Um, I still need to watch the first season of Invincible and then watch that. So... If you're uh, hearing this list and it's getting closer down to uh, the bottom of the list and I haven't seen Invincible yet and you're like, oh my god, he's going to put Invincible at number one. Um, no, I haven't seen it. So that being said, let's dive into this. Coming in dead last place, we have the movie The Flash. Um, I am still really upset about this and I will probably um, forever be upset about this. The Flash is, in my opinion, one of the coolest characters Ever. I feel like they have so many great animated shows that do him justice. They have a lot of really good uh, animated movies that do him justice. The comics do him justice. He's one of the coolest characters ever. He's finally getting his big screen debut, and it is a dumpster fire of a movie. There's a lot of things that I could complain about. Um, specifically, a lot of people will quickly jump to, this CGI was terrible, um, or stuff like that. Uh, my main problem is actually kind of more on the storytelling aspects of this. You pick a super iconic superhero like The Flash, who has one of the biggest rogues galleries in the entirety of comic book history. The only people who I think have more villains than him are literally Batman and Spider-Man, like the two most iconic superheroes ever. And you have so many really cool and complex villains you can choose from, and they chose none. I am so upset. For one, seeing the reverse Flash in live action in a movie with a high budget cgi oh, could have been epic um there's so many there's just so many really really cool flash villains i would have loved to see and instead they kind of went with uh let's uh, do a future displaced version of uh, our main superhero and try to do this cool twist at the end with the villain and uh it doesn't work the villain's in the movie for maybe about three minutes you almost see bad cgi nicholas cage in this movie longer than you see the actual villain of this movie and uh that's kind of a problem um other things that i don't like Usually, the DCEU has one consistent thing that I would say they have better than the MCU, and it is usually the costuming, and then for this specific movie, they decided that these costumes were, were great. I don't know, I don't know. I could go on and on about how much I disliked The Flash, so I'm gonna leave it there. Overall, I just think that this movie was so, so, so overhyped, and maybe that's why it's so low on my list, is because I was expecting more, and when it finally came out, the final act was one of the worst final acts in a movie I've ever seen. It was so bad that it ruined the movie for me. I thought that there was a lot of things that this movie had going for it, um, but the uh, final action sequence with Zod killing Supergirl and Batman over and over again was cool. It was interesting, and it would have been epic if we got to actually spend time with them redoing that sequence over and over and over again, trying a bunch of different things. But instead they montage through it for about five minutes and then decide to give us just a bunch of random cameos that nobody really wanted. Really drove me insane. And I really think this movie could have been 10 times better, but that's why it's at the bottom of the list. Coming in at number 13, this is another one that was just incredibly, incredibly disappointing. We have the TV show Secret Invasion for one, I really wish that Marvel had taken the Secret Invasion storyline from the comics and really built it up and made it the Avengers movie of Marvel Phase 4 and Mar Marvel Phase 5. I feel like the Avengers is such a big iconic thing and all the Avengers movies make a lot of money and having an Avengers lineup that is set is something that really keeps people interested in Marvel content. Since 2018, there has not been an Avengers lineup at all. It's been about five years since we've had an established this is the Avengers, this is who they are, and you take what is in the comics, one of the coolest Avengers storylines, and you turn it into a TV show, you make it just basically Nick Fury, the TV show, and uh, the character work in it is incredibly lame. I think that Nick Fury's character in it is absolutely awful, and I really hate it because Gravik was played by uh, 
Kingsley Benadir, who absolutely killed it, right? I think he's doing a fantastic job. His acting in this is incredible. We got Ben Mendelsohn, who once again, his acting is incredible. Olivia Coleman, who's doing great. Maria Hill. Wait, crap. I said I said the character name. I said the actor's name. Colby Smulders. Um, just, there's just such a stacked cast with so many talented actors and actresses, and then the writing just gives them nothing to work with. The storytelling is not great. Um, the scrolls in this movie, I mean, in the show, aren't really bad. Like, there's one evil scroll and it's graphic and he's fully justified the entire movie i mean the entire show he's attacking nick fury because nick fury actually wronged the scrolls he did terrible terrible things and uh it just bothers me because nick fury never gets held accountable for his actions in this um they turn Rhodey into a scroll but they refuse to tell us when he became a scroll and the implications of that this show sucked a lot Now, coming in at number 12, I know a lot of people are not including this in their rankings, but I watched this entire movie, so I, I want to talk about it. We have Spider-Man Lotus. Um, personally, I think that this movie wasn't wasn't terrible, right? Like, I, I don't want to say that it's bad, but I will say this movie could have potentially been huge for people all over the world who wanted to make fan films that were full-length feature films for superhero movie content, because... I've seen some in the past where people have been like trying to make some for The Flash back when The Flash TV show was kind of at its peak and stuff like that with Green Arrow and, and Batman and stuff like that. And fan films, I think, are really cool. And there's definitely room for them to kind of start coming in with better storylines because I think that with Godzilla Minus One that released last year, there is a lot of talk about how good storytelling trumps CGI budgets. It trumps having these big studio amounts of money put into these projects. If you have somebody who is dedicated in the storytelling aspect, they could hypothetically make a better movie than some of these big studios because they care so much for the characters. And so when I saw Spider-Man Lotus, a fan film was coming out and a lot of people had talked about it, not for great reasons, but a lot of people had talked about it and I saw it came out. I was like, you know what? Let me watch this. And um, there are a couple things here that were decent. I think that the shocker suit is one of the best live action shocker suits we've ever seen. Um, and I think that the Spider-Man suit is okay. Like it's not bad, uh, but overall it's not really a Spider-Man movie. They do the death of Gwen Stacy, but they never really introduce us to Gwen Stacy. And uh, it's pretty much just this person, and this person have a conversation about the death of Gwen Stacy and they're really sad. And then this person and this person have a conversation about the death of Gwen Stacy and they're really sad. And uh, Spider-Man's just talking to a kid about all of these great things he, he did as Spider-Man. And the entire movie, you're practically like, man, I wish I could have saw that instead of what we're currently seeing. And then on top of that, uh, all of the action sequences and the swinging sequences were all showed in the trailers, which I thought was very disappointing. Coming in at number 11, we have Aquaman 2. Personally, I think that Aquaman 2 had so much potential. It had such a great setup from the end of the first Aquaman movie, we just got to see Jason Momoa's character go through this really, really interesting character arc. He had so much character development. He uh, is still obviously the goofy, fun, loving person that we love Jason Momoa as, but he was kind of finally taking on the responsibility of being the king of Atlantis. And then this movie, they don't really show him being king at all. And every time he is shown as being the king, he's basically talking about how being the king is just a giant snooze fest. And then we have him doing illegal stuff, breaking his brother out of prison, showcasing the entire movie that his brother is better suited to be the king of Atlantis. And then this movie doesn't end with his brother becoming the king of Atlantis and Aquaman just focusing on being a dad. I think that there was really interesting story that could have been told where Aquaman, after spending all this time with his long lost brother Orm, realizes that he's not meant to be a king. And maybe he took on way too much responsibility without really knowing what was going to happen when he took on that responsibilities and he should have learned the consequences of his actions and he should have done things to make the future of Atlantis potentially better and thrive and he could have stepped aside to become a good father figure and he could have you know had a really good character arc in this movie none of the characters have any character arcs whatsoever there's a lot of forced humor in it that doesn't work really well the cgi is pretty much the only decent thing about this movie and even then there are some sequences that aren't that great um there's characters like uh randall park's character who once again i feel like he doesn't need to be in the movie they just wanted somebody for us to sympathize with to kind of try to force emotions out of us and it doesn't work at all starting off our top 10 we have 
Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Um, I could talk a lot about all the things that I didn't like about this movie, but uh, I think a lot of it just comes down to the fact that, um, sometimes there are formulas in place for a reason and sometimes if you have something that's working you should not change it you should you should kind of keep it going um ant-man movies have always been the cal palate cleansers of the mcu they've always been small contained stories that don't really necessarily revolve around the entire world ending and uh they're usually like fun little heist films which i think is such a fun thing for the Ant-Man trilogy. I think that overall the first two Ant-Man movies were great because they knew that they were smaller in scale and they played that to their advantage. In this movie, they decide, okay, we're gonna have him facing a villain who's trying to destroy the universe and it doesn't feel like an Ant-Man movie at all in this movie. And along with that, we have Cassie Lang who doesn't really get any character development amongst, I mean, after the fact that in the first sequence she gets arrested like her father and we find out it's because she's fighting for a cause about people who are lost their homes because of the blip or whatever and that's interesting stuff they should have dove into the character work a little bit there but instead we just kind of get this like weird father-daughter movie where these three characters are going around this world and exploring and being like oh my god whoa this is a different world and uh fighting occasional weird creatures and then father-daughter getting arrested and having weird conversations with this evil dude and uh overall this movie is just very very boring the uh, world kind of did not help um there are some sequences where they're shrinking and growing and it just doesn't look like they're shrinking or they're growing because it's just all on a green screen and um one of the only redeeming things about this movie was jonathan major's portrayal as kang but i don't think it was a good enough villain portrayal to really save this movie at all Alrighty, now coming in ninth place, we have a movie that I actually really enjoyed, and these all are going forward are going to be movies that I liked. Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Personally, I think that this movie was pretty interesting. I think that a lot of people absolutely hated this movie as soon as it came out, and I think that to a lot of the people who disliked this, you just maybe probably weren't the target audience. I feel like this movie is more of a superhero movie that was for kids, and um, there's a lot of just great humor that works really well for children, and I think that um, some of the sequences, like them riding in on a bunch of unicorns, is cool, right? Like, I think that it's just a fun movie. It's superhero movies being what superhero movies should be. It's a bunch of campy things. It's a bunch of weird things. It's a bunch of um, things that wouldn't necessarily work in other mediums. I think that it's a fun movie. I like the fact that the magical aspect that they go for here, instead of feeling like Doctor Strange magic, like a lot of recent superhero movies has, they kind of go for more of a Harry Potter magic. We have a room full of floating doors. We have books that fly. I think that that part was fun. I think that the world building was interesting. And um, overall, I think that Freddy's character, Freddie Freeman's character in this movie, absolutely crushed it. I believe it's Jack Dylan Grazier who plays him. She's so much fun in this. And I like the full fact that um that character at least has a lot of really good character work because he is, a, first of all, foster kid. So, you know, that's, I mean, that actually doesn't really have much to do with his character but this time. But um he's somebody who's always relied on a crutch and he's always had these uh, problems walking and stuff like that. He has a disability and now he has these superpowers and now he doesn't feel disabled anymore. He doesn't um, feel that weakness that he used to feel in the past and he kind of starts abusing these new superpowers and he starts being really cocky and arrogant and over the top and in this movie they strip him of those powers and now he's somebody who's been kind of taking for granted these powers that he had and he has to go back to having a crutch and not being able to walk properly and stuff like that and I think that that was really interesting like that worked really well and I don't understand why so many people hated this movie I thought it was so much fun. Coming in at number eight, this is another movie that I know a lot of people disliked, uh, The Marvels. Personally, once again, I think that this movie was fun. If this movie had came out in 2014, a lot of people probably would have loved it. And um, a lot of the things that I enjoy about it are Kamala Khan. She is fantastic in this. She is the future of the MCU and I'm excited for it. Like, I'm not gonna lie. I think that Amon Vellani did an incredible job with this movie and um, she's fun. The, uh, what's it called? Three main actresses in this have a good chemistry going on. There's a lot of sequences where they're having kind of like a slumber party on a spaceship and stuff like that. The stuff with them balancing books on their heads and practicing their powers is fun. I like the action sequences where they're hopping from place to place to place to place. Um, it's just a super fun movie. And I know that a lot of people, they're like, movies need to be darker, they need to be serious, or they need to have a lot more weight to them and stuff like that. I think that in the year 2023, while there's a lot of bleak stuff happening in real life, it's good that some of these movies are just fun to watch. 
Coming in at number seven, we have the movie Blue Beetle. I absolutely love this movie. I've been stoked for this movie since I heard it was coming out. And um, it flew so far under the radar that the majority of the people who probably would have enjoyed this movie didn't even know that it was coming out because the actor strike, the writer strike were really at large here. And um, I guess the movie themselves decided, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not going to market this, but it's a shame because Zolo Maradawanas, I definitely just butchered his name, future editing self put his actual name up on the screen. Uh, he kills it in this role. It is so much fun. And something that I've always told people who don't know who the Blue Beetle character is and aren't really interested in this, I always tell them, it's DC's Spider-Man. It's going to be like a Spider-Man movie, and it hits all the notes that you would want a Spider-Man movie to hit. There's a love interest, and he's, in, you know, struggling to fall in love with his love interest. He's a quippy superhero. Whenever he's getting into fights and stuff like that, he makes a bunch of jokes, and he's fun like that. Um, and then, on top of that, he has kind of some of those sadder moments where he's having to deal with loss and his family, and, um, I think that this movie is great. I think that there's a lot of emotional sequences in it. Yeah, the CGI towards the end is not great. And I do think that the final battle is incredibly underwhelming, but it's everything I wanted from a coming of age superhero teenage movie. Um, it was fantastic. I loved it. Coming in at number six, this might be controversial. I honestly have no idea. What if season two? I love the What If Seasons. Um, what's it called? What If Season 1 is one of the things that I've most rewatched out of Marvel Phase 4 and Marvel Phase 5. Um, it's just, it's so fun. I love everything that they do with this. I think that for one, they have a lot of really great What Ifs. I think that this season did a lot of, uh, took a lot of inspiration from other things. Like, I definitely think that um, the, like, Mario Kart type episode where they're on Sakaar is such a fun episode, and I think that it's great. I like the fact Tony Stark didn't die in every single one of the episodes. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember this. What if season one, Tony Stark dies in pretty much every single episode. In this one, he's in a couple of episodes and he doesn't die. And it's great. It's very exciting. Um, but yeah, I, I like some of the stuff that they did with this uh, season. I think that the 1602 stuff is really, really cool. And I will say... I do think that they are way overusing uh, Captain Carter, but I think she's fun in this. I think that this is kind of interesting, making it kind of like a Captain Carter type show. Um, but yeah, the Hela episode was fantastic. Uh, I really liked the first episode and how it kind of felt like, uh, what's it called? Blade Runner? I, I think that this uh, show is slowly getting better with each season, and I think next season will probably be even better. I'm loving it. Coming in fifth place. This one was so out of my radar. I did not see it coming, but Gen V. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, I love this movie. I, I, I mean, show. I love the show. I thought it was fantastic. First of all, I want to go ahead and say this. The boys universe with Amazon Prime, they know how to make weird powers and they know how to have people just casually using their powers all willy nilly. That is my favorite thing about the boys universe. In a world where people have superpowers, they would use their superpowers for the most mundane crap. And this show gets that so much. I like the whole premise of let's see what a college full of a bunch of superheroes would look like. And it's just a lot of fun. It's a really fun movie. I like the fact that they kind of set it up as kind of like a murder mystery type feel. And they're trying to figure out, you know, what's going on at this school because something isn't right here. And um, I think that the twist of um, Kate kind of being a villain in this show is actually really interesting. I don't, I don't know if that was a twist to most people. It caught me off guard. And I was like, what? Not Kate? Oh my God. How? What? I was like, I was, I was kind of flabbergasted. But um, overall... I think that this show was pretty interesting. Um, I think that a lot of the character dynamics work really well together. I loved Jordan Lee's power set is so interesting to me. I think that that is one of like the best, um, what's it called? It's woke things that um, a superhero movie has done in a really long time. Having a trans character who can change, you know, their gender at will. And uh, whenever they change from like female to male, they have different power sets. That is brilliant. Like, that is just so cool. And both the actors, um, well, actors and actress or whatever, who play Jordan Lee, literally give off the same vibe and energy. Like, they did such a good job with casting that role. It's so good. I loved The Boys Gen V. Coming in at number four, I was so glad this movie was as good as I hoped it would be. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. This movie was so fun. It was so fun. Uh, first of all, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles being teens, about damn time. I think that they were just so fun in this. I love the youthful energy. I love the fact that um, when Seth Rogen was making this, he was like, you know what? These four kids, they're going to be recording all of their lines together in the same room. They're going to be hanging out. They're going to improv if they want to improv. They are going to be teenagers. They're not going to try to write the dialogue for them. If there's sequences where they need to, you know, 
have a conversation about this, you know, specific thing, he's going to basically explain to them what the idea is that they're trying to do in this scene and just let them work. And it works incredibly well. They have a bunch of fun moments where they just feel like actual brothers, which I absolutely love about this uh, movie. And I think on top of that, we also get epic action sequences, really, really good music. The animation style fits the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles so well. I know a lot of people what before it came out were like, that is terrible animation. Maybe that's the point. I think that the whole animation with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is uh, it's supposed to be grimy and gross. They live in the sewers. They live in New York. It's it's fun. It's fantastic. And the last thing I want to talk about, Splinter's dynamic as Father Splinter instead of Master Splinter is fantastic. Jackie Chan's voice acting in this is so good. And it was so unexpected. I absolutely love this movie. Very emotional, very action-packed. A lot, a lot of fun. Coming in at number three, this was hard ranking my top three, but I put Loki season two at number three and uh, hear me out. It is incredibly hard to rank shows against movies and um, my top two obviously are going to be movies and this is the show that's on top for me. Um, my main problem with Loki season two, the only reason why it's not higher on the list is because there are a couple of characters who get introduced and we have like full episodes with them like Brad Wolf who has zero significance to the show. He doesn't really add anything. After that one episode that is pretty much all about him, he doesn't do anything. He just kind of disappears and fades into the background. And I feel like that kind of happens with a couple of characters in the show. We kind of get the same thing with Ravona Renslayer. After episode four or episode five, she just kind of falls off the map and then we don't really get any conclusion for her character. And the same thing with Miss Minutes. They kind of reboot her at the end of the show, but we don't have a general idea of, you know, if her memories are fully gone, if she's going to turn into an evil sentient clock and try to, you know, kill people, we have no idea. And I think that that is the only thing that Loki season two doesn't have going for it. It has an incredible score. It has epic action sequences. It has a lot of fun characters. OB, fantastic. When we meet um, the actual human of uh, Mobius and it's Don Perlman or whatever, and he's a salesman and he's trying to sell people on jet skis. It is so much fun. This show does everything that you would want this show to do, and it completes Loki's character arc from the first season incredibly well. Everything comes full circle. He becomes the uh, tree from uh, Norse mythology, which I definitely cannot pronounce the word of. Um, it's just so beautiful. It's amazing. He has his glorious purpose, and I love the fact that he's burdened with glorious purpose, and his last line of dialogue is his last line of dialogue from the first Thor movie. It's just such a perfect full circle moment for Tom Hiddleston, and I teared up watching the finale it was incredible but that being said we have my probably biggest hot take for the entire year last year um spider-man across the spider-verse is not the best superhero movie that came out last year um i absolutely love it i think it's an incredible movie i think that there's a lot of really good action sequences it does a lot of really cool animated stuff like having the uh world that gwen stacy lived in being more of a like watercolor palette it's so cool and i love all of the animation stuff that they do this movie's incredibly beautiful it has a really good soundtrack with metro boom and um it has great characters it has a lot of really good representation with daniel kalua as spider punk and uh spider-man indian this is great and i love the movie i think it's fantastic um i think that the spot is an incredible villain and i think that a lot of movies should really learn from what they did with spider-man across the spider-verse if you pick a like b tier or c tier villain who not a lot of people know about um surprise you can kind of create your own backstory for him and people won't question it because turning spot into just a random scientist who worked at alchemax and who got caught in the uh what's it called super collider from the first movie perfectly ties it in to spider-man into the spider-verse and perfectly ties it into miles story and perfectly creates this villain versus hero like fight that just is perfect and it's fantastic and i absolutely love it and um a lot of people's complaint about this movie is that it doesn't have an ending because it's a part one or whatever it does have an ending if you focus on this movie it starts off being gwen stacy's movie and it ends being gwen stacy's movie because it comes full circle she talks about how she can't be in a band because she doesn't fit in with people she doesn't work well with others and then it ends with her forming a band of people who she works well with so it does have a full conclusion and i do think it's a really good movie but i just think i need to wait till the conclusion comes out before i can fully decide that it's a better movie than what i currently have sitting at my number one but that being said coming in at number one i have guardians of the galaxy volume three some people will definitely disagree with me on this, but I think it is the probably the best 
Marvel Cinematic movie that has ever came out. I know some people will probably strongly disagree. I know some people really do not like James Gunn, which I don't know where that's coming from, but um, this movie is incredible. First of all, you have like six Guardians who need to have their stories tied up in this movie. You have um, Adam Warlock, who was introduced in the last movie, who you need to somehow work into this movie and you need to do that all in a contained story that makes sense and includes the origin story of Rocket Raccoon. How are you going to do that? James Gunn found a way to perfectly thread all of those needles and create a perfect finale for this franchise. And I think it's fantastic. I think that Star-Lord's character in this movie is incredible. I think that Chris Pratt really showed off his acting chops here. And I absolutely loved everything about him in this movie, um, Nebula. Once again, Karen Gillan showed off her acting chops. She's an incredible leader in this movie. Absolutely love it. And I think you can just go down the list of all the Guardians actors. They all came to play and they all did incredible in this movie. And I absolutely love it. We have, in my opinion, one of the best action sequences that happened the entire year. The hallway fight at the end of the movie with uh, the Guardians is so well done. The CGI in this movie, I think it's the best CGI we've gotten in any Marvel movie ever. Because all of the little different creatures and the hell spawns and whatever they're called look insanely good the higher evolutionary an evil person who's evil for the sake of being evil when he screams the line there was no god so i stepped in <sighs> it goes so hard i absolutely love everything about this movie i think that the music selection is fantastic i think the cinematography is fantastic and uh, overall the fact that no characters died is what puts it above everything else for me. I feel like every other Marvel movie where they're trying to make a big statement, they feel like they have to kill off a character. And James Gunn showed how you can make a movie without killing off any of the characters and still have a super emotional climax to the movie. And I think that that is what gets me for it. He starts off the movie showcasing that all these characters are incredibly strong and any of them could die at any given moment, but none of them do. And they all make it to the end and it is beautiful. And the final song, the dog days are over. Such a perfect sequence, such a perfect conclusion. I would argue it's one of the greatest trilogies of all time. But that being said, that was it for this video, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming by and checking it out. I love and appreciate you guys so much for watching. If you liked it, feel free to like and subscribe and uh, make sure to let me know your guys' list down below because I know this is gonna be very different from a lot of your guys' list. Um, so feel free to let me know your list. Let me know your top three. Let me know whatever you wanna let me know. Um, I love discussing movies, so I will be replying to as much comments as possible. But yeah, that's going to be it for me. Peace out. Bow, bow, bow.